You're scrolling through your dating app at 11 p.m. on a Tuesday. Again, you swipe left on someone who looks great, but whose bio is just gym fire muscles. You swipe left on someone whose profile is genuinely interesting, but whose photos make you feel nothing. You match with someone who seems perfect, gorgeous, and intelligent. You meet up. Within 20 minutes, you realize they're actually neither. Just good at angles and copying philosophy quotes. Later that night, venting to your friend, you say something you've said a hundred times before. Why is everyone I date either hot but stupid or smart but unattractive? Why can't I find someone who's both? Your friend laughs. That's just how dating is. You have to pick your battles. But here's the thing. Your friend is wrong, and so are you. The problem isn't that attractive, intelligent people don't exist. They absolutely do. You probably know several of them. They're married. They're in long-term relationships. They're not on your dating app at midnight. The problem is math. Specifically, a statistical illusion so powerful, so counterintuitive, that it's warping your perception of reality every single day. It's making your dating pool look worse than it is, and you have no idea it's happening. This illusion has a name, Berkson's Paradox. And once you understand it, you'll never look at your Instagram feed, your dating matches, your restaurant reviews, or your friend group the same way again. But before I show you why your love life is mathematically doomed by selection bias, let me tell you about the hospital that accidentally made lung cancer look like it protects you from diabetes. Chicago, 1946. World War II just ended. Medicine is advancing rapidly, and a statistician named Joseph Berkson is looking at patient records at the Mayo Clinic when he notices something that doesn't make any sense. Berkson is studying the relationship between diseases. Specifically, he's trying to figure out if having one disease makes you more or less likely to have another disease. Doctors want to know this. If a patient comes in with cholecystitis, gallbladder inflammation, should they be extra worried about diabetes? Or does having one condition somehow protect against the other? So Berkson does what any good researcher would do. He looks at hospital records. He finds all the patients admitted with cholecystitis and checks what percentage of them also have diabetes. Then he compares this to the percentage of patients admitted for other conditions who have diabetes. And he finds something shocking. Patients with cholecystitis were less likely to have diabetes than other hospital patients. The numbers were clear, significant, reproducible. According to the data, having an inflamed gallbladder somehow protects you from diabetes. Except that's insane. There's no biological mechanism. Your gallbladder has nothing to do with your pancreas's ability to produce insulin. These are completely unrelated conditions. Berkson dug deeper. He looked at other disease pairs and he kept finding these bizarre negative correlations. Patients with lung cancer appeared to have lower rates of heart disease. Patients with one type of infection seemed protected against another. The hospital data suggested that having certain diseases made you immune to other diseases, like your body could only handle one major illness at a time and would somehow protect you from getting a second one. This would be revolutionary if it were true. Nobel Prize level discovery, a complete rethinking of how disease works. But Berkson realized it wasn't true. It was a statistical illusion. The problem wasn't the diseases. The problem was the hospital. Think about it. Who ends up in a hospital? Sick people. But not all sick people. You don't go to the hospital just because you have mild diabetes that's controlled with diet. You don't get admitted just because you have early-stage gallbladder inflammation that responds to medication. You go to the hospital when things are bad enough that you need to be there. So what you're actually seeing in hospital records isn't a random sample of all sick people. You're seeing a filtered sample, a selected sample. You're only seeing the people who got sick enough to be admitted. Here's where it gets tricky. Let's say there are two conditions. Let's call them disease A and disease B. Both of them can land you in the hospital. Some people have disease A, some have disease B, some have both, some have neither. If you have both diseases, you're definitely getting admitted. Two serious conditions? You're absolutely sick enough for hospitalization. If you have disease A but not disease B, you might get admitted. If disease A is severe enough. If you have disease B but not disease A, you might get admitted. If disease B is severe enough. If you have neither disease, you're probably not getting admitted at all unless something else is wrong. Now here's the key. Among the people who made it into the hospital, who are you more likely to see? People with both diseases, definitely. They're the sickest. People with just disease A who have particularly severe cases. People with just disease B who have particularly severe cases. Notice what's missing? People with mild disease A and mild disease B. They might be sick, but not sick enough to be hospitalized. They're at home, managing their conditions with medication, 
So when you look at the hospital records and ask, what percentage of disease A patients also have disease B, you're not seeing the full picture. You're seeing the severe disease A cases who got admitted for disease A alone, and you're comparing them to the disease A plus disease B cases. But you're missing all the mild disease, A people who also have mild disease B but never made it to the hospital. The result? It looks like having disease A makes you less likely to have disease B, when in reality, you've just filtered your sample in a way that creates a fake negative correlation. Bergson called this a collider bias. The hospital admission is the collider. It's the thing that both diseases can cause, and when you filter by it, you create an artificial negative relationship between the diseases. But here's the really wild part. The same math that was making diseases look negatively correlated in hospitals is the exact same math that's making your dating pool look terrible. Let's talk about your love life. Or rather, let's talk about why you think everyone available is either a 9 in looks and a 3 in personality, or a 9 in personality and a 3 in looks. Imagine we're looking at the entire population of single people in your city. For simplicity, let's rate everyone on two scales, physical attractiveness and personality, intelligence both on a scale of 1 to 10. In the real population, these traits are mostly independent. Sure, there might be small correlations. Maybe attractive people have slightly more social confidence from getting positive attention. Maybe intelligent people are slightly less attractive on average because they spend more time reading than at the gym. But mostly, attractiveness and personality are random. You can be a 10 in looks and a 10 in personality, or a 5 in both, or any combination. So in the full population of singles, you'd see plenty of people who are both attractive and have great personalities. They exist. They're out there. But here's the problem. You don't have access to the full population of singles. You have access to the people you're willing to date. And that's a filtered sample. Think about your standards. You probably won't date someone who's below a certain threshold in either looks or personality. Maybe you need them to be at least a 6 in attractiveness or at least a 6 in personality. Ideally both, but you'll accept one or the other. So who ends up in your dating pool? People who are nines in looks and fours in personality. They make the cut because they're attractive enough. People who are fours in looks and nines in personality. They make the cut because they're interesting enough. People who are sevens in both. They make the cut because they clear both thresholds. People who are tens in both. They make the cut because obviously. But here's who you don't see. People who are fives in both. They don't make your cut because they're below threshold in both dimensions. You swiped left. You never gave them a chance. They're filtered out. Now, among the people who did make it into your dating pool, what's the distribution? The 10 in looks people you see tend to be lower in personality. Because if they were 10s in both, they'd already be in a relationship. The attractive people who are still single and available are more likely to have personality flaws. Not because attractiveness causes personality flaws, but because the people who have both tend to get snapped up quickly. The 10 in personality people you see tend to be lower in attractiveness, for the same reason. The brilliant, funny, emotionally intelligent people who are also gorgeous, already taken. The ones still available have something keeping them single. And the people who are mediocre in both, you never even see them. They were filtered out before they entered your awareness. So from your perspective, looking at your dating pool, it looks like there's a negative correlation. It looks like attractiveness and personality are inversely related. Hot people seem dumb. Smart people seem ugly. But it's not true in the general population. It's only true in your filtered sample. You created a collider. People I'm willing to date. And by filtering on it, you created an artificial negative correlation between two traits that aren't actually negatively correlated in reality. You berksoned yourself. You created a paradox in your own dating life by applying standards. This is Berkson's paradox. When you select or filter a sample based on a combination of two variables, you can create an artificial correlation between those variables that doesn't exist in the unfiltered population. And before you think, well, I should just lower my standards then, wait. Because the paradox doesn't care about your standards, it affects everyone, whether they're picky or not. Even if your threshold is low, you'll date anyone who's a four or above in looks or personality. You still create the paradox. You're still filtering out the people who are low in both, which still makes it look like the two traits are negatively correlated among the people you do see. The only way to avoid Berkson's paradox in dating is to literally have no standards whatsoever and date everyone regardless of any attribute, which, good luck with that. Now you might be thinking, okay, interesting thought experiment about dating, but this is just theory, right? 
This doesn't actually affect anything important. Wrong. Berkson's paradox affects life and death medical decisions every single day. Remember Berkson looking at hospital records in 1946? His discovery didn't just explain weird correlations in disease data. It explained why decades of medical research had reached completely wrong conclusions about which diseases were related. For years, studies based on hospital patients suggested that smoking might protect against certain diseases. Not lung cancer, obviously. The connection there was too strong to miss. But other conditions. The data seemed to show that smokers had lower rates of certain illnesses. Except smoking doesn't protect you from anything. It's poison. It damages nearly every system in your body. What was actually happening? Berkson's paradox. Smokers were being hospitalized for lung disease, heart disease, cancer, all the things smoking causes. Non-smokers were being hospitalized for other reasons, diabetes, gallbladder issues, other conditions. When researchers looked at the hospital population and asked, do smokers have disease X? They were comparing the smokers who came in for smoking-related conditions to the non-smokers who came in for non-smoking-related conditions. The smokers who died at home from smoking-related illness before making it to the hospital, not in the data. The smokers with mild disease X, who also had mild lung damage but weren't sick enough for admission, not in the data. The result? It looked like smoking was negatively correlated with some conditions when, in reality, researchers were just looking at a filtered sample that created an artificial negative correlation. This same bias has affected countless medical studies. Any study that looks at hospitalized patients rather than the general population is potentially subject to Berkson's paradox. And for decades, that's how most medical research was conducted. Because hospital patients are convenient to study. They're right there. Their records are accessible. They're already being monitored. But convenient doesn't mean accurate. In 2020, during the early days of COVID-19, some studies of hospitalized patients suggested that people with certain conditions might be at lower risk of severe COVID. The data seemed to show protective effects for some pre-existing conditions. Epidemiologists immediately recognized Berkson's paradox. These studies were only looking at people who made it to the hospital, which meant they were filtering the sample in exactly the way that creates artificial negative correlations. Later studies that looked at population-level data showed that those protective conditions weren't protective at all. It was the selection bias creating an illusion. How many medical treatments have been developed based on studies corrupted by Berkson's paradox? How many doctors have been trained on textbooks that cite research affected by selection bias? How many patients have received suboptimal care because the studies that informed treatment guidelines were looking at filtered samples? We don't know, but it's not zero. And it's not just medical research. Berkson's paradox is everywhere once you start looking for it. Think about restaurant reviews. You go on Yelp or Google reviews to find a good restaurant. You look at the ratings and reviews. Now, who leaves reviews? People who had experiences extreme enough to motivate them to write something. People who had an amazing meal, they leave a review. People who had a terrible meal, they leave a review. People who had a perfectly fine average meal, they don't bother. They got what they paid for and moved on with their lives. So what you see in the reviews is a filtered sample. You see the five-star experiences and the one-star experiences with fewer of the three-star middle ground experiences represented. This creates a paradox. Restaurants with more reviews often have more polarized ratings, not because the restaurant itself is inconsistent, but because you're seeing a sample filtered by extremity. The selection mechanism, meals extreme enough to motivate a review, creates an artificial pattern in the data. You know those restaurants where half the reviews say, best food of my life, and half say, worst service ever? Berkson's paradox. The restaurant might be perfectly average, but you're only seeing the tales of the distribution because those are the people motivated to write reviews. Think about your social media feed. You follow people on Instagram or Twitter or whatever platform you use. Who posts? People who have something worth posting. A major achievement, they post. A major complaint, they post. An ordinary Tuesday where nothing happened, silence. So your feed becomes a filtered sample of human experience. You see everyone's vacations, promotions, engagements, and breakups. You see their political rants and their celebrations and their grief. What you don't see is the 95% of their life that's boring and ordinary. That gets filtered out by the selection mechanism of worth posting about. The result? Everyone on social media seems to have a more extreme, more dramatic, more intense life than reality. Everyone seems to be either wildly successful or falling apart. Everyone seems to have strong political opinions. Everyone seems to be either blissfully happy or deeply struggling. It's not that these people don't have ordinary moments. They do. 
you're just seeing a filtered sample that excludes the ordinary, which makes it look like extremity is the norm. You're experiencing Berkson's paradox every time you scroll. So the next time you're scrolling through your dating app at midnight, frustrated that everyone seems to be one-dimensional, remember, they're not. The next time you're on social media convinced that everyone has more extreme opinions than you, remember, they don't. The next time you're reading restaurant reviews convinced that a place must be wildly inconsistent because the reviews are so polarized, remember, the restaurant might be fine. The next time you see a medical study claiming that two conditions are negatively correlated, remember, ask whether they used hospital patients or population data. Because Berkson's paradox has corrupted medical research for decades, the world is not as polarized, not as extreme, not as trade-off driven as your filtered samples make it appear. There are people who are both attractive and intelligent. There are people who have moderate political positions. There are restaurants that consistently deliver good food. There are diseases that really are independent, even though hospital data suggests otherwise. You're just not seeing them because of how the sample was selected. If this changed how you see your dating pool, share it. If you've ever wondered why everyone seems so extreme online, hit that like button. Subscribe, because now that you know about Berkson's paradox, you'll see it everywhere and you'll never trust a filtered sample again.